All right, good morning, everybody. So first off, I want to thank those of you who attended yesterday's workshop. I think it was productive. I think we had a good time, as much of a good time as you can have going through uh, problems. So remember, we've got another one on Wednesday. If you attended Monday, you don't need to attend the second one. It's the same thing. If you did not attend yesterday, I highly encourage you to attend Wednesday evening. We were done by about, it was pretty close to 7 o'clock, I think. So about an hour and a half, so, so plan on that. Uh, and basically what I did was I threw up the, the exam on, on the screen and we went through them one by one, giving you all time to work through each problem, kind of under test-like speed. Uh, and then I spent a little bit of time uh, going through them and then ask, you know, giving you an opportunity to ask me any questions. So I look forward to the rest of you. And remember, that's for 60% of your missed credit. And that's the last time that you'll, you'll have that type of an opportunity, just given the nature of the semester. The semester's coming to, to a fast end. So there is a section in Canvas that is labeled Workshop that is worth zero credit. So it's not adding to the course total. And then I put in 60% of your missed points. Uh, in there, so uh, it's it's definitely in your interest, regardless of the grade that you got to to attend. <clears throat> so I look forward to seeing the rest of you on on Wednesday. Before we uh, get into finishing up chapter ten today, believe it or not, we don't have too many slides on chapter ten. I want to do a little bit of a refresh. This molecule. Does anybody know what that is? How would you describe that to me right now? What words come to come to your mind when you look at that structure? Pardon? Yeah, we got an aromatic ring. Okay, yeah, so there's an aromatic functional group. What else? There's a amine group. There's an amine? What kind of amine is it? Uh, secondary. It's secondary, right? The nitrogen's connected to two other carbons. So we've got something that has an aromatic ring, something that has a secondary amine. What else would you tell me about it? Yeah, there's a stereo center. Where's that at? Yeah, okay. Yeah, right there. We got a, we got a stereo center, right? So we've got a chiral center. The hydrogen's coming out towards me. The methyl group's going behind the plane of the board. Everything else is in the plane of the board as I've got it drawn. All right, this, these are things that you would tell me, and I'm very happy to hear, you know, the, the, the feedback here. That's, that's good. You're, you're starting to recognize a lot of different things in terms of these molecules. It turns out that this molecule is methamphetamine. Meth. This is legal meth. This is the stuff you can go right now to uh, Walgreens or CVS and you can buy in a Vicks Vapo inhaler and you can inhale it and it opens up your, your, uh, your airways. Uh, so that you can breathe easier. It is LEV methamphetamine. LEV meaning lever rotatory, meaning that it rotates plain polarized light in the counterclockwise direction. Okay? Okay, so you can legally buy that. But it is the same as methamphetamine structurally, other than the chiral center is different. Okay? So, first thing that I want you all to do is. What's the stereochemistry of that chiral center? Assign priorities. What priorities can we easily assign? Hydrogen's the easiest, right? It's going to be number what? It's going to be number four. Number one's also pretty easy to do. What's number one? Nitrogen, right? Nitrogen. It's going to be number one. So I've got one and four. 
Now I've got to decide between this carbon and this carbon, right? So what do I do when I have that? I have to look at other carbons, right? So I'm going to look at this carbon and I'm going to ask what's attached to it. I'm going to look at this carbon and I'm going to ask what's attached to it, right? So this carbon is attached to another carbon and two hydrogens. This carbon is attached to what? Three hydrogens. What wins, carbon or hydrogen? Carbon. So this is going to be group number two. And this is going to be group number three, right? Now we've got the priorities. Now what do we do? Yeah, we need to move the hydrogen to the back away from us, right? So if you built a model, you'd grab the hydrogen, you'd turn it away, right? But I know that this is like looking at Big Ben the clock from the wrong way, right? Mm -hmm. And I know that it looks like it's going one, two, three, which is what way? Counterclockwise. So it must really be going clockwise. So this is R. This is the R enantiomer of lead methamphetamine, or of methamphetamine. Okay. Pharmaceutical companies in the United States, in the United States, make lead methamphetamine so they can put them in your Vicks vapo inhalers. Okay, there's a small amount of. It. Has anybody in here ever used a vapo inhaler? Yeah, yeah. Do what do they smell like? Figs. Okay, they kind of have a minty smell to them, right? Yeah, so they're kind of a sharp smell, right? Yeah. Turns out methamphetamine really doesn't smell too much in terms of itself, so they add other things. These things are like essential oils and things like that to help, help with the breathing. So let's just say it's mixed with, with, an, with some type of oil. And oil is typically just a pure hydrocarbon. So let's just call it hydrocarbon. Meaning it's just carbon and hydrogen. Okay. With some oil. Now what I want you to do is I want you to take that Vicks Vapo inhaler and I want you to give me pure lead methamphetamine from it. How would you do it? So you know that the Vicks Vapo inhaler contains a little bit of this. It's usually about 10 to 15 milligrams, a very small amount. And it's mostly this, the stuff that just smells good. How would you go about separating those two things so that you could give me, in a vial, pure crystal meth that is legal to own? I've actually done this experiment. In my, in my lab, we need, uh, I had a colleague who needed methamphetamine to do a test on something, and it didn't matter which, which enantiomer he had. So instead of getting a DEA license so that we could have illicit methamphetamine, we just said, well, if the enantiomer doesn't matter, let's just get it from the Vicks Vapo inhaler. So I had my graduate student actually go into the laboratory and figure out how to extract out the lev methamphetamine from all of this oil. What do you know about oils? Are they typically soluble in water? No, they're not, right? You always have heard the term oil and water don't mix, right? Fair enough. So this is probably not going to be water soluble. And let me put an X to it. It's probably not going to be water soluble, right? Is this going to be water soluble? What's the rule? The five carbon rule, right? So if I have five carbons or less for every group that can form a hydrogen bond with water, it should be soluble. I've only got one functional group that can form a hydrogen bond with water, and that's the amine. But how many carbons do I have? I count 10. Is that going to be soluble in water? Does that satisfy the five carbon rule? No, it does not. Huh. I keep talking about water a lot, don't I? How are we going to get this molecule into water and not this molecule? 
What do we know that are really soluble in water? Say it, please. Salts. Salts. Salts are really soluble in water, right? Salts are really soluble in water. And I've got an amine. An amine also has to have what on it? What didn't I draw? A lone pair, right? So there's a lone pair here. So I've got a base. Right? I've drawn methamphetamine in the quote unquote free base form. What do you think will happen if I take this mixture and I place it into like say 10% hydrochloric acid, very dilute solution of hydrochloric acid? What do you think is going to happen? Is anything going to happen to the oil? It's just a pure hydrocarbon, right? Nothing's going to happen. Okay, so it's going to remain unchanged. What's going to happen to my methamphetamine, though? It can become an ammonium salt. An ammonium salt. That's right. Remember, amines will react with acids, and I will form an ammonium salt. anything with my chiral center is going to leave it alone. It's just going to react there. And of course I'll have the chloride. So now I have an ammonium salt plus my oil. And I know that salts are more soluble in water than a typical organic compound. So this no longer has to follow the five carbon rule. And it turns out that this is more soluble in water. So this will go into the water layer. Right? Where will the oil go? Separate layer. It'll separate and form its own layer, right? And so now I've got two layers that I can separate, and I can get my ammonium salt into the water, and then I can get the amine back by simply neutralizing and reacting with base to remove the, the acidic proton, right? And so we learned last time that we use a special apparatus for this, and my art is not great. Okay, and we call this a separatory funnel, right? So we will put the mixture in the separatory funnel. So here's my water layer. And up here, let's say I use ether to dissolve the, the oil. Ether will dissolve oils. Ether is lighter than water, so it appears on the top. I will take my mixture. I'll put a little cap in it. I will shake it up. I'll let it separate. The water will go to the bottom. The ether will go to the top. I will then drain the water layer off, and that water layer will have my ammonium salt. The oil will stay behind in the ether. Okay? And so in that water layer now, I've got my ammonium salt that I want. All I gotta do now is, is convert it from an ammonium salt back into an amine. Simply just treat it with sodium hydroxide and that does it. And I can get my uh, free amine. This is what my graduate student did for my colleague. We got these beautiful crystals. I mean, it, crystal meth, they call it crystal meth for a reason. It does grow beautiful crystals. At the small amount, he was able to take it, and then they were making uh, chemical sensors to try to detect things like methamphetamine. And I don't, can't remember if it worked or not, but. Is that Dr. Brew? No. Dr. Well, Dr. Brew may have been a graduate student at the time. It was in, it was in his advisor's lab, yeah. Okay. Uh, and so that's how we were able to, to get this, okay? So you could legally go get a bunch of Vicks vapor inhalers and you could legally separate out all of the methamphetamine and you could even legally sell it, but nobody's getting high, okay? So uh, it doesn't cause any kind of psychedelic or brain activity. It only opens up your airway, okay? And so. It is a medicinal compound that does have uses. This is another example of structure matters, right? The right-handed version of methamphetamine is, has a good use. The left-handed structure, a bad use, right? And so, but there's only about 10 to 15 milligrams, if I remember right, in each Vicks Vapo inhaler. So it takes a lot, a lot of Vicks Vapo inhalers before you get a, a good chunk of material. And I think we took, I don't know, three or four of them and broke them open and 
extracted out and got plenty of that molecule for him to, to use. How is methamphetamine related to dopamine? It's a similar structure in what respect? You're right. Just let's go a little deeper. What's similar about the structure of methamphetamine and dopamine? They both have a what? Yeah, they both got have a benzene ring, right? So there is a six-membered ring. Dopamine has something else on the benzene ring. What is it? Those OHs, right? So it's technically a phenol, okay? So there's, but it's similar. It's both of them are aromatic, have aromatic rings. What else is similar? Both have an amine, and really kind of in the same place, right? So if you go one, two, right? It's two carbons between the aromatic ring and the, and the nitrogen, all right? What's different? Alcohols are different. What else is different? Dopamine is a primary mean, whereas methamphetamine is a secondary mean. What else does methamphetamine have that dopamine does not? This other methyl group, right? There's an extra carbon here, right? And there's an extra methyl group there. More carbon allows methamphetamine to more easily cross the blood-brain barrier. Dopamine has a little more difficult time crossing the blood-brain barrier, but uh, because this has more of this carbon, it can cross the blood-brain barrier a little easier. Okay? So very similar in, all, in a lot of respects, but different in key aspects as well. And so since we know that dopamine works in the brain, we would also suspect that methamphetamine would work in the brain. And in fact, we know that it does, right? So. So let's talk about how we can make amines. Not amines, amines. There's a couple of straightforward ways to make amines. And the easiest way is just by simply doing an SN2 reaction on an alkyl halide. So we'll just, we'll just pick on, I don't know, let's say bromoethane. And I'm going to react it with an excess of ammonia. So just a lot of ammonia. And you can think about an SN2 reaction where the nitrogen attacks the carbon of the alkyl halide through an SN2 mechanism. And you end up with the ammonium salt. I just made a carbon-nitrogen bond, which is necessary for an amine. Okay? Now, I've used a lot of ammonia, so ammonia now will react with the ammonium salt to make the free amine. And that made what kind of amine? What's one with a little zero? One degree amine, what does that mean? That is a primary amine. We just made a primary amine. seems like a pretty easy reaction to do, doesn't it? Just take an alkyl halide and react it with an excess of ammonia. Ammonia is easy to get. You all have this probably at home. Most cleaners, glass cleaners especially, like Windex, contain ammonia. Pretty cheap, pretty easy to get a hold of. This only works if you use a huge excess of, amine, of ammonia. Excuse me. A little bit of this and a swimming pool full of this will give you this nicely. The problem is one of, again, structure and kinetics. It turns out that the primary amine is a better nucleophile than ammonia. When I put an alkyl group on the nitrogen, it makes that nitrogen more nucleophilic. It makes those electrons more willing to reach out and react with an electrophile. So, I just generated a little bit of this in a sea of this. So what do you think happens now? 
You think it just stops there? It does not. This is now more nucleophilic than this. Since this is more nucleophilic, that means that this is going to react fast, faster. So this now reacts with more alkyl halide. Does another SN2 reaction to give me a secondary amine. What do you think about a secondary amine? Do you think they're more nucleophilic or less nucleophilic than a primary amine? Take a guess, given what I've written up there. How many are for more nucleophilic? You're right, it's more nucleophilic. So now the secondary amine doesn't stay as a secondary amine, so what does it do? It reacts with the extra uh, alkyl halide that you have, and it does another SN2 reaction, and it makes a tertiary amine. What do you think the tertiary amine is, more or less nucleophilic? It's more nucleophilic, so it reacts with the extra uh, stuff that's around faster than anything else before it, and it finally makes a quaternary ammonium salt. Nothing can happen at this stage. This reaction is really only practical for making quaternary ammonium salts. That's it. If you want to make a quaternary ammonium salt, you take an alkyl halide, you take a little bit of ammonia, you stir them around for a couple of hours, and you make the salt. The last time we talked about these salts being useful as antibacterial, and antibacterial soaps and other things, this is how they do it. They take an alkyl halide or mixture of alkyl halides, and they react with ammonia and ultimately get to those quaternary ammonium salts. So if you're in the business of making a symmetrical quaternary ammonium salt, that means where all the R groups are the same, this is the way to go. But if you want to make a primary amine and a primary amine only, this is a terrible way to go. You can't stop it because the product is more reactive than the starting material. Okay? And so primary amines are more reactive than ammonia, so they react. The secondary amines are more reactive than the primary amines, so they react. The tertiary amines are more reactive than the secondary amines, so they react. And finally, it gets to a quaternary ammonium salt where it just stops. And so it'll go through all of that cascade to make a quaternary ammonium salt very, very easily. Okay? This is how we make quaternary ammonium salts, is through the SN2 reaction of ammonia on an alkyl halide. What alkyl halides do you think work really well here, since it's an SN2 reaction? What do you think? What kinds of alkyl halides would you want to use? What kind of alkyl halide did I draw up there? Okay, it's a bromide, but what kind of alkyl halide is it? Which one is it? It's a primary, right? That carbon's only attached to one other carbon. This works really well for primary alkyl halides. Works really well for alkyl iodides, alkyl bromides, and alkyl chlorides. It does not work with alkyl fluorides. Um, and so, we all know about the leaving groups on the SN2 reaction, right? So, that's how this reaction will go. So, what do we do if we want to make uh, a primary amine? Well, technically, we can use that primary alkyl halide with an excess of ammonia. But again, technically, you could get it to stop at the primary amine. But you literally, I mean, the ratios are essentially a thimble full of this and a swimming pool full of this. It's not practical. Now, you have to overwhelm it with a mean for this to work. So imagine your swimming pool in your backyard filled with ammonia, and you dumped a thimble full, you know what a thimble is, right? A little tiny thimble full of alkyl halide into the swimming pool. You think your boss is going to be happy with you with that kind of synthesis? No. You're wasting a lot of the mean, right? So even though this is possible, it is highly impractical, okay? But making ammonium salts, very practical using this type of, type of process. Uh, here's an example where we're taking, what kind of a mean is this? That's a tertiary mean. So somebody bought this tertiary mean and reacted it with methyl bromide and made this quaternary ammonium salt. Very, very easily, no other byproducts, 100% yield essentially. Uh, 
Actually, these things do go to 100%. Um, usually, you, whatever you lose is just due to your poor lab technique. Um, but the, these, these types of reactions to make ordinary ammonium salts work very, very well. Okay? There is another way to make amines. And that is to reduce nitro compounds. Okay? So we can take a nitro compound So let's take uh, nitromethane. Anybody know what nitromethane is used for? Anybody like to watch funny car racing? They run on nitro. Okay, they're nitro fuel. That means that they are they use a mixture of methanol and nitromethane for the fuel. Nitromethane is a very good uh, high energetic fuel. Okay, so it's pretty readily available. It's easy to do. Notice what I have. How is nitromethane similar to methylamine? What is similar about those two structures? The number of bonds. The number of bonds. Okay. What else is similar? Okay, well, actually they're both methyl. Carbon isn't abound to any other carbon, right? Real close though. What else is similar? The nitromethane has a carbon-nitrogen bond, doesn't it? The amine has a carbon-nitrogen bond. I've already got the carbon-nitrogen bond, what do I have to do? What do I have to do to nitromethane to get Methylamine. What do I got to do? <coughs> I got to replace the oxygens with what? Hydrogen. hydrogen. I'm replacing oxygen with hydrogen. What kind of reaction would that be? If I'm going from less oxygens to fewer, or from more oxygens to no oxygens, what would that be? Would that be reduction or oxidation? Yeah. That is reduction. I've got to reduce the oxygens on nitrogen to hydrogens, and then of course you'll get water, right? So I need uh, two of those to give me my two oxygens, okay? So what do I need up here? How have we learned to reduce things so far? It's actually up on the slide. What, but what have we learned so far? We've learned that we can reduce carbon-carbon double bonds using what? We can use hydrogen and what? And something like palladium or platinum, right? Okay, so there they're using palladium on carbon, but hydrogen and palladium will do this. So I can take nitromethane, I can reduce it with catalytic hydrogenation and get the amine. And then I'm going to come in if I was your boss and I'm going to fire you for doing that. And I'm going to fire you for doing that because hydrogen's not cheap and palladium certainly isn't cheap. And you're going to take a cheap starting material and you're going to make a cheap product with something very expensive. That's, that's not that's bad business. And the easiest way to get fired from any job is to, is to make something cheap the most expensive way you can, right? It's not a good idea. It's called cutting into your profits. But there is another way in which we can reduce these using much cheaper materials. We can actually use iron or tin in the presence of hydrochloric acid. Those metals will also reduce nitro groups to amines. Iron's cheap. Right, I can go to Lowe's right now, I can buy a bucket of iron nails, and that's all I need. I can also go to Lowe's and buy a deal with something called muriatic acid, which is nothing more than 30% hydrochloric acid. I can buy everything I need at Lowe's right now to reduce nitromethane to make methylamine, okay? But I'm not, I can't buy hydrogen there, and I can't buy palladium there. 
right? So even though that technically will work, chances are you're going to use something like iron and HCl to do that reduction. Okay? So you literally take the nitromethane, usually you take something like a nail or a piece of iron and you grind it up into fine filings so that it's fine. You throw that in there and then you start dripping in hydrochloric acid and you will make the amino compound pretty easily. Okay? So these are metal reductions. It turns out that iron and HCl or tin and HCl will not re reduce a carbon-carbon double bond. It's not good at that. But it is good at reducing a nitro group into an amino group. Okay? So, I want you all to take, uh, let's take five minutes, and I want you to figure out how to take benzene and make aniline out of it. So I just got a truckload of benzene in, but I don't want benzene, I want aniline. So I'm gonna have each one of you come up to my lab today and make the aniline for me. How would you do it? Work with your partners, figure it out. It's more than one step. You got five minutes. So work out a synthesis for converting benzene into aniline.
How are we going to think about this problem? Nitration. Pardon? Nitration. Nitration. Yeah, we're probably going to have to go through a nitration. This brings me to a topic that we have yet to talk about. It's called retrosynthetic analysis. And we're not going to do a lot of it. But it is thinking backwards. It is not backwards thinking. Those are different things. It is thinking backwards. Where else do you all use thinking backwards in your everyday lives? You all are used to this idea of retro something. Huh? Thinking back on your day. Oh, okay. Yeah, thinking back on your day. Where else? Math. math? Okay, you might use thinking backwards in, 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 in some math problems. Process of elimination. Process of elimination? Yeah, maybe, maybe that is. Could be. What about if you lost your car keys? How many people there have lost their car keys before? Yeah. Did you think about where you were that at the moment you woke up to try to find them, or did you start with, I'm right here, where was I, where might I have left them, right? I don't have them now, but I'm going to go back in time and figure out where I was at to see if I can find them, right? So if you go to Starbucks and you reach in and try to get your car keys or your card or whatever, you realize it's missing, you think about the place that you were before, that maybe I left it there, and then you, if you didn't find it there, you think the one previous, right? You all are used to this idea of thinking backwards, okay? And it's very, very important to have at least some skill in this. If you're ever gonna be a physician or you're gonna be a crime scene investigator, you're always gonna be thinking backwards, right? Somebody shot, they're lying on the floor dead. That's what you know, and you gotta work backwards to figure out what happened, right? That's what you gotta do. Chemists have to do the same thing. We have to think backwards, right? I want amino benzene. I've got benzene. There is no way to do that directly. I'm telling a little bit of a lie. There is. But for us, there isn't, right? But what do I know? And by the way, a double-headed arrow like this means retrosynthetic, so I'm thinking backwards, right? I know that I can make that amino group from, somebody said, a, a nitrobenzene, right? I know that I can make or convert nitrobenzene into aniline. But I don't have nitrobenzene yet either, right? So i got to think backwards once again. And I know that I can get nitrobenzene from benzene. So how many steps is this going to take? You're going to take a couple of steps, right? Maybe a little work up here and there, but we're going to ignore that for the most part. All right? So now let's think forward. We just did the backwards thinking. Now let's do the forward thinking. So I know that I want to get to nitrobenzene. What do I need? What kind of reaction is that? Three letters. Pardon? That's not an SN reaction. No. This has to do an aromatic ring, right? What do we call that? E. A. S, <laughs> like EA Sports, right? Electrophilic aromatic substitution, right? We're going to do an electrophilic aromatic substitution reaction. We want to put a nitro group on, a, on an aromatic system. What reagents do I need here? It's chapter 9. What reagents do we need? HNO3. I need HNO3 and something else. H2SO4. H2SO4. And I know that will make nitrobenzene. That's electrophilic aromatic substitution, chapter nine stuff. Do I want nitrobenzene? No, I want aniline, right? So 
So how would I do that? Yeah, so I can use, let's just use tin and hydrochloric acid, that'll do that just fine. On the exam, you could have put iron in HCl, you could put tin in HCl, and technically you could put hydrogen and palladium on carbon, right? It's just that using hydrogen and palladium on carbon is going to be very, very costly, right? So we're not going to do that, okay? So this is how we can get to what we want from what we have by using the reactions that we know. And we used retrosynthetic analysis to figure out how we needed to do that. You are not going to have a lot of retrosynthetic analysis on exam three. Okay, it's a, it's, a, it's a higher level technique. But what I want you to understand is that thinking backwards is just as important as thinking forwards. It's how we solve problems. Okay? If one day you decide to go to medical school and you're doing your residency, you're going to have somebody come into the hospital sick. And you're not going to be thinking forward about how they're sick. They're sick right now. They got sick in the past. And so you're going to get some data. You're going to figure out what is likely to have caused that. You're going to be thinking backwards. This is a skill and a technique that every, um, every profession needs some level of, of knowledge. I mean, even if you're an auto mechanic, right? Car comes in. It's not running right, right? You're not thinking about it in the future. You're thinking about what in the past caused that, right? So this idea of being able to think backwards is a very, very important skill and technique to, to master. And so you're going to practice that to some level in this class. So let's do another one. Let's suppose I have go about thinking backwards about this one? What do, I, what do I look at and compare it to? How do I think about this problem? Okay, what's new? What's different? I know I'm starting with this, which is what? What is that? It's a tertiary mean. What's my product? It's a quaternary ammonium salt, right? It's not an amine anymore. Okay, so I'm going to look at this and I'm going to look backwards to this and see what's the same and what's different to figure out what I need. What's the same between these two molecules? All right, so the aromatic ring is the same on both of them. I'm going to cross them out. It's already there. What else is the same? The nitrogen. So, yeah, the nitrogen is the same, so I don't have to put any more nitrogens on. What else is the same? The ethyl group is the same here as it is here, so I don't need to mess with putting any ethyls on, right? What else is the same? All right, so one of these methyls is the same, right? So what does that leave me? 
CH3 and I, right? That's what I've got to put on that to make this. So what am I going to put over here? Iodomethane, CH3I. That tells that counter ion of the salt tells me what alkyl halide I need. This tells me that I need a CH3. I need a methyl iodide. This is going to be an SN2 reaction. And it's going to make that quaternary ammonium salt for me quite nicely. Okay? There will be something on exam three where you will make something like a quaternary ammonium salt. And you have to figure out what alkyl halide you need. Okay? This is how we do this. Let's try another one. Take a couple minutes. All right, help me out. What do we have to do? What do we got to do here? Okay, you're thinking forwards. You're not wrong. Let's think backwards. All right, I know I want that quaternary ammonium salt. So thinking backwards, what's the same between that quaternary ammonium salt and starting material? The benzene ring, right? So I know that I've got to have something that has the benzene ring already on it in the, next, in the previous step, right? Okay. What would that be in the immediately previous step? What would that be? Okay, so I need an amine, right? So if 
I have this, I could get to that. Right? Do I have that? But how can I get that? I can get that through nitration, right? Or from the nitro, I shouldn't say nitration, from the nitro. And then I can get that by nitration, thinking backwards, right? So it looks like we've got three steps here to do, doesn't it? So starting with benzene, I'm going to nitrate it. Then I'm going to take that nitro benzene and I'm going to do what to it? I'm going to reduce it. And then I'm going to take that amino benzene or aniline and I'm going to react it with what? I'm going to react it with an alkyl halide. In this case, CH3 what? Br. I'm going to react it with an excess of CH3 Br. That's right. So I'm going to first take the benzene and I'm going to nitrate it. And we just said that we need nitric acid and sulfuric acid to do that. I'm then going to reduce the nitrobenzene. What am I going to use here? What reagent would I use? FHCl. Okay, I can use iron and hydrochloric acid. That'll work. And that'll give me the amino benzene. And then the third thing that I'm going to do is I want to react it with CH3Br, right? At least three moles of it. But I'm just going to write here excess. I'm going to use an excess of it. And that's going to give me that quaternary ammonium salt. I need at least three, but I'm, 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 I just write excess up there because I know that bromomethane is pretty volatile, so you usually use a lot of it because it tends to evaporate pretty easily. Stoichiometrically, I only need three. I've got three of them up there. So again, that's how we think about these problems in reverse. So that wraps up chapter, what is this, chapter 10? 10. Chapter 10? Wraps up chapter 10 for us. I have your quizzes from the last time. I'm going to hand them back in class. These quizzes, I sent you all a, a, a message in, in um, Canvas today. They have a check mark on them. That check mark means you got full credit. It means I did not grade them. Okay, so I will post the solutions in Canvas later. So you're basically getting um, credit for turning this one in. So as I call your name, raise your hand, Gabriel. Anthony.
Jail. You can't stop that. We have finished chapter 9, so we have a quiz today. Let's figure a good one for this. Turn in um, nine twenty one, nine point two one. On Thursday, we will begin chapter eleven, which is on spectroscopy. Okay, it's a technique that organic chemists use. We're going to talk about two flavors of spectroscopy. Infrared spectroscopy, which is what we're going to cover on Thursday. And then next Tuesday we will cover nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy, NMR. Okay? So those are coming up. You need to read ahead before you come in. There is a little bit of arithmetic. Not too bad. Okay? Um, Come at least knowing the general concepts of what these techniques can give us. Okay, so read, read through that material before you come on Thursday. When you've got your problem ready and your name on it, you can put it up here and you can have 15 minutes of your day back. So have a good uh, rest of the day and I'll see you all on Thursday.